OK, well, thank you all for coming. Um, so I'd like to speak today about some uh, joint work with uh, with Mark Stern. Um, and specifically, an idea that I am rather keen about that I like to call surface theft. Um, so if it's not clear what I mean by uh, the end of the talk, I hope someone will ask me about it. But let me set the stage first with uh, an example that motivates everything that uh, everything that I'm going to speak about. So we're going to consider a certain uh, congruent subgroup uh, of um, SL2 of a ring of integers. If I just left this as is, maybe mod plus or minus 1, this would be one of the uh, classical congruent subgroups of uh, SL2C that we normally think about. It corresponds to uh, a modular curve. But I'm going to make a, an innocent looking change. And we're going to look at a different integer ring. So you join the square root of minus 11. So the question is so how large is, um, well, it turns out that if you take this group and, and abelianize it, it's some finitely generated abelian group. So it looks like z to some power plus a finite group. And the question is, how large is this finite group? So to be really concrete, I'm going to give you name for you a specific ideal in this integer ring. Uh, there happens to be one of norm 4,999. Uh, and Halok computed for us uh, how big this abelianization is. So does anyone have a guess? For, for comparison's sake, if we weren't working with that integer ring, but if we were working with the usual integers, sort of independent of p, the size of that finite group would be bounded, maybe less than 36, something like that. So does that, anyone have a guess here? <laughs> Very big. <laughs> so um, so z to some power plus. OK. OK, keeps going for a while. Uh, and it turns out that this thing is a a 53-digit long prime number, which I'll call little p. I'm not cheating. It's not just 3 to some big power. <laughs> right. <laughs> Tough one to guess. That's not even it. If you look at this group, there are other summons that have. <laughs> um, the size of this uh, finite group is, is even bigger. and um, What's more, if you look at data, this is, I mean, it's hard to imagine something like this being a, a, a total accident, and, and it's not. When you look at congruent subgroups of SL2 over that integer ring, it turns out that torsion rules the roost. So um, if you're a quantitative kind of person, maybe this already piques your interest. But if you're not, maybe you're uh, a number theorist who likes thinking about uh, about Sayre's conjecture. <laughs> and I'll point out that sort of um, in some sense, the way I like to think of this question is the, the larger that this finite abelian group is, in some sense, the, uh, 
the richer Sayers conjecture is. OK, so how would you go about trying to, uh, to prove something like this? The, uh, the fact that this finite abelian group uh, is so big. So the most robust method uh, that I know is a theorem that was conjectured by, by Ray and Singer. And it was proven independently by, by Cheeker and Mueller. And I'm just going to write it in uh, sort of cartoon form as L equals um, H times R. So for us, H is the, the order of this uh, order of this finite abelian group. And um, R is some term that measures. Uh, so this is a theorem about Riemannian manifolds. So wh where's the Riemannian manifold in, in, in the picture? It turns out that this group, gamma naught p, it sits inside of uh, SL2 of the complex numbers, which has a, uh, an isometric action on this beautifully symmetric space, hyperbolic 3 space. And H is, you can also think of it as the size of this quotient. Okay. R, in some sense, measures the, uh, measures the, uh, the complexity of this, uh, of this homology group, the geometric complexity. And um, there's uh, interesting work that relates this a priori geometric complexity to, to arithmetic complexity, to, to arithmetic heights. But I don't have anything to, uh, to say about that. What I will say is, in some sense, um, so the goal of my work with Stern. Ah, so L. Uh, L I'm actually, so I'm not going to define properly yet, but um, I'll just say that it takes into account spectral information on this hyperbolic three manifold. And I'll also say that I wrote it in this way because it's very much akin to special value formulas that you see in number theory that relate the special value of an L function to some very interesting finite abelian group times a measure of uh, uh, the complexity of an associated lattice in a, in a real vector space. I noticed that uh, uh, is in the co compact. It, it is. I'm being a little so imprecise here. The same formula with the it, has, has, it has to be modified in the non compact case. And what is, uh, so, um, right. <coughs> so, to be a little more precise. Suppose that H1 of. If the first Betty number is 0, R wouldn't be there at all. If the first Betty number is 1, so suppose that, um, suppose that H1 uh, of MZ mod torsion. is generated by a loop gamma and say that uh, H is a harmonic 1 form, then you can say that this R, um, uh, I'm not sure whether it should be R or its inverse, but it's, the, it's, a, it's a period. This divided by the, the L2 norm of H. OK. And it's quite remarkable that this can be related to, uh, can be related to arithmetic heights. So the goal of this project with Stern was to to prove growth of L. And there's, uh, um, so there's work of, 
Uh, so I'll mention um, um, Akshay and Nicola Bergeron, and also uh, Simon and, and Mueller. Uh, proves growth of L. In this analogy that I made to, uh, to L functions, they prove growth at non-central points. And the goal uh, is to prove growth of L uh, evaluated Yeah, that's right. So your enemy, if you're trying to prove growth of this uh, this number L, at a, so the the family that's varying in this case, uh, for, so for example, is the is the prime ideal, and we don't even know. So are there? infinitely many p for which the finite part of that abelian group is non-zero. And this is despite the fact that we expect the, the size to be approximately equal to exponential in the, the norm of that prime ideal times. 1 over 6 pi times an explicit constant. Um, so theory and experiment are <laughs> very far off uh, here. So your enemy, or one uh, big enemy in trying to prove growth of L is, well, the values of this, uh, let me just call it an L function. Um, they're not changing that much. So you might imagine that you have zeros of the L function that are extremely close to the central point. And if that happened, that would certainly inhibit the, uh, inhibit the growth of L. Um, and Yeah, that's right. Um, I'm sorry? The, so the, the L would vanish if the Betty number were, were positive. But just. Precisely, it's a determinant of certain capacity which can be expressed in terms of the self -reported. Yeah. So let me. So let me write this Cheeger Mueller theorem down in a form that's analytically usable. Um, I'll just write down the essential parts and any attack on trying to prove growth of L. So what they prove is that the logarithm of the, so if M is a closed, hyper doesn't have to be hyperbolic. A closed Riemannian three manifold. So, the logarithm of the size of the torsion in this in this finite group uh, plus the logarithm of that term R plus actually let me assume that it's hyperbolic. So you sum logarithm of one over lambda where lambda is a one form. It's an eigenvalue of the, there's a Laplace operator that acts on zero forms, one forms, two forms, and so on. Uh, so, and lambda is small. Lambda is less than the volume of m to the minus delta. Delta is some constant greater than zero. This sum divided by the volume of the manifold is approximately equal to exponential in 1 over 6 pi times 
times the volume of m. There's no delta that appears on this side. What I mean is that uh, sort of, whoops, I already took logs and divided by. Yes, put the volume on the left. So really, I mean the right side depends on delta. And as delta approaches 0, it would approach 1 over 6 pi. So this, I don't, as I said, I don't, I don't have anything to say about bounding this regulator term. It wouldn't appear that it would just be 0 if the first Betty number were 0, which happens uh, very often. So this project with Stern concerned what can we say about, about this term. And when you consider the state of the art of what we know about the number of eigenvalues uh, for one forms that are less than this number, it's hard to imagine sort of proving that this term divided by the volume is small um, without knowing something of this strength. So question. Can you prove that the um, 1 over the smallest one form eigenvalue on m uh, is less than or equal to, say, some constant times the volume of m to some constant, like 1,000? It doesn't matter. For comparison's sake, if you were looking at um, that equation that maybe I just erased it, or is it? So this is sort of like if L is the, an arithmetic L function corresponding to an object of conductor n, this would sort of be like asking to prove that if you have the, the central point, try to prove that there's no 0 that's closer than uh, like a negative power of the, the logarithm of the conductor away from the central point. Or another analogous thing would be sort of if you're working on the upper half plane um, to try to prove that if you have, um, if you have a, an arithmetic hyperbolic surface, try, try to show that there aren't any eigenvalues of the Laplace operator on functions that are too close to a quarter. So try to prove some kind of gap like volume to the minus 1,000. So part of the, the, the difficulty that we had with this question is that we didn't even understand at first what these, this is kind of an opaque thing that I've written down. What do what do small eigenvalues of the one form Laplacian on a hyperbolic manifold even mean? Um, is there some geometric way of thinking about them? And it turns out that there is. So, so. it turns out that small eigenvalues small one form eigenvalues on this is a closed hyperbolic manifold correspond to um, short loops, short geodesics. which bounds some surface inside of the manifold. But the problem is that the sort of the minimal area of such a surface that bounds this short loop is incredibly large. So if you had an eigenvalue that were exponentially close to 0, it turns out that's equivalent to saying that there's a, there's a loop that has very modest length, something like at most logarithm of the volume. And it can't be bounded by any surface except one that has unbelievably big area, like exponential in the volume. Um, 
and sort of a little more precisely, uh, we show that this, the square root of this, up to factors that are just um, constant powers of the volume, uh, is um, basically equal to um, if you have a um, if you have an element gamma inside your your fundamental group which bounds a surface that's equivalent to saying that it's a it's a commutator so I'll modify this in a second but it's sort of like the I add an s here to to mean stable so if gamma sort of bounds a surface, so does gamma squared, gamma cubed, and so on. So stable commutator length of gamma, it's like the, it's sort of the, the, min, the minimal uh, genus of a surface that bounds gamma to the n divided by n. And it turns out this is smaller than commutator length. Um, divided by divided by the length of, of gamma. And a geometric way of thinking of this is you, you, could re you should really think about this as the smallest area of any loop that bounds gamma to the n divided by n. OK, so uh, I'm not sure if I, am I out of time already? Or? Yes. OK, so I'll stop here. <laughs>